Um, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, my friend, Dr. Patrick La Rochelle. So uh, Patrick and his wife, uh, Patrick is uh, both an internist and a pediatrician. And I can tell you as a pediatrician myself, I can't even master one specialty, much less all of that. Um, but Patrick's wife, Anna, is also a nurse practitioner, and the two of them, along with their children, Luke and Miriam, have spent the last four, better part of the last four years um, in east, the eastern portion of the Democratic Republic of Congo, near where uh, the Ebola outbreak is going on right now. Um, they've done that in a missionary capacity with a small Christian missionary group known as Surge. It's an unpaid position, and uh, so that you can obviously imagine they put themselves in harm's way for several years now um, to do very important work there in Congo. And in the course of doing that work, um, Dr. La Rochelle uh, was assisting a woman uh, infected with Ebola virus and sustained a high-risk exposure himself, and that's how he found his way here to Nebraska. I won't waste any more of his time, so Patrick. to be able to share with you my experience in quarantine. Um, I imagine that if you um, generally are standing up a, at the podium in front of a, a group of this stature, you've probably earned that right, either by scholarship or public service or some other accomplishment. Um, turns out that there's a more efficient way to get to the podium, and that is <laughs> touching any bowl of patient without gloves. A little bit about me. My name is Patrick La Rochelle. I'm a physician with a specialty in combined internal medicine and pediatrics, as Ted said. In 2005, prior to starting my medical studies, I traveled with several doctors to the Democratic Republic of Congo, to a city called Goma. And while there, a, our host, who was a, a Congolese orthopedic surgeon, he told us of a village to the north where he had previously worked and where a tribally related massacre of over a thousand people had taken place in 2002. Many of, his many of his friends had been killed and the hospital had been destroyed. I left this trip fascinated by Congo and convinced that I never wanted to live there. A war that had left millions dead, tribally related massacres, an epidemic of rape, this was too much for me. Fast forward eight years, I was three years into my four-year residency, now married with a son. Both my wife and I had felt a call to medical missions, and we had been accepted to World Medical Missions post-residency program, which connects young doctors to mission hospitals around the world and funds them to work there for two years in hopes that they'll feel called to stay and work in those low-resource settings. World Medical Missions suggested that we consider two hospitals, one in Cameroon and the other in Eastern DRC in a village called Nyankunde. And as we researched these hospitals, it quickly became evident that Nyankunde was the village I had been told about in 2005, the village where over 1,000 people had been massacred in 2002. Uh, if you can see right near the border with Uganda, there's a Lake Albert, and you can see a city named Bunya, and we're about 43 kilometers from there, a little bit north of Beni, about four hours' drive from Beni, which is near the epicenter of the, of the current outbreak. So needless to say, this gave us pause. Was it safe to bring our kids there? Obviously not. Safe is not a very helpful word in Congo. Um, could we responsibly bring our kids there? After several months of seeking counsel, praying, talking with friends, we felt called to go to Nyankunde. As Christians, we believe that God calls us to go where the world is in pain and to work for healing and the Democratic Republic of Congo is the definition of the world in pain. So we've now lived in DRC for almost four years. After completing our two years with World Medical Mission, we joined a Christian mission called Surge. And it's an odd experience living in Nyankunde. It's beautiful. We generally feel very safe. We don't live in a walled-in compound. The people are incredibly welcoming and grateful for our presence. <clears throat> 
Our kids have wonderful expat and Congolese friends, and so do we. This is a picture of our hospital, and we live right kind of near in the trees near the right side of that picture. It's a gorgeous place. And yet, wherever you walk in the Nkunde, you pass ruins, buildings like this. Almost everyone we know lost family members in the massacre. Uh, a minor rebel group, more like a group of bandits, has attacked the fringes of our village on multiple occasions, stealing livestock and valuables. And major rebel groups, such as radical Islamist group ADF Nalu, have at times been less than 100 kilometers from us. Recently, a former nurse um, who had worked at our hospital was kidnapped with his family by ADF Nalu around 120 kilometers from us, and there's been no word about their whereabouts. And, of course, since the beginning of August 2018, there's been Ebola. Though the epicenter of the outbreak was around four hours' drive from us, it seemed like a matter of time before it reached our town. Uh, not only have the people of North Kivu, the province to our south, uh, where the, the epicenter of, of the outbreak is, not, not only have they been very resistant to Ebola control efforts, preventing rapid control of the outbreak, but our hospital is also known as one of the best hospitals in the region. And we frequently receive patients from that area near the epicenter. In November, Ebola cases started multiplying approximately 60 kilometers from, uh, from us, uh, southwest of us, and that raised our concern even further. But at the same time, uh, the staff at our hospital were, I think, experiencing what you might call vigilance fatigue. All those cases that we've been preparing for, they just weren't coming. December 21st was a normal day for me until about 2.30 or 3 p.m. I was about to leave the hospital when I ran into the head of our obstetrics unit. And she told me that a hypoxic woman had just been transferred to our ICU. She added that she'd been found to have a dead fetus in her womb. Fetal demise can be the presenting sign of Ebola in a pregnant woman, even uh, and often in the absence of fever. And we were aware of that, uh, but it can, uh, that can also be caused by many other things. I decided to check in on the patient before leaving the hospital. Despite wearing gloves with almost every patient since uh, August to avoid an Ebola exposure, I forgot this time. I grabbed my stethoscope, listened to her heart and lungs, and they sounded fairly normal. The heart was a little fast, but other than that, I couldn't find a reason for why her oxygen levels were low. I'm not sure what made me step back and reevaluate the situation, but after about 30 seconds, I thought, I need to figure out where this woman is coming from. And as soon as we received the answer, it was clear that the case was very suspicious for Ebola. She was from a village where cases were starting to multiply. She was pregnant with a dead fetus. She was agitated, encephalopathic. Her eyes were red, like pictures of Ebola patients that I had seen. And at least she was oozing blood from a site where they, they had attempted an IV. What followed is a blur. So I think I forgot to, uh, no, actually, no. Um, the patient died two hours later, just as a team was arriving to take her to an Ebola testing center. They were able to get blood samples, and the next morning we received news that she was positive. This is the group who, who buried her body. Several hours after receiving that news that she was positive, um, I was vaccinated with me and my colleagues and a number of uh, members of the patient's family. We decided that my family should move to another house and avoid direct contact with me. And they ended up evacuating several days later on Christmas Eve to sort of wait out this, um, this outbreak in our town uh, until all the cases were accounted for. And this is our goodbye. Uh, I was asked to stay about three meters away uh, to avoid any problems with uh, our colleagues crossing the border into Uganda. The initial plan was for me to remain in quarantine in Nyankunde. But later, after conferring with the CDC, it was recommended that I be moved to Beni, where there's a functioning Ebola treatment center with all the experimental therapeutics. However, due to increased insecurity related to the upcoming election and suspicion of Ebola efforts, it was quickly apparent that Beni was not an option. And it was increasingly doubtful whether I would have access to Ebola treatment in Beni if I were to, to get sick. And in fact, this happened the day after we decided not to go to Benny. Uh, this uh, Ebola isolation center was attacked. And so, with the help of the State Department, Phoenix Airways, University of Nebraska, and other partners, I was evacuated to the States. 
I left Nyankunde the morning of, the, of December 27th, traveled by road to Bunya, then by air to Goma. This is uh, a picture of Goma. It's sandwiched between beautiful Lake Kivu and an enormous volcano, which erupts occasionally. Um, and then the next day, I was picked up by this jet, uh, Gray Phoenix Airway jet, which I think is well known in, in, um, in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and um, I think the, the airport staff thought that I was some sort of celebrity or the head of the CIA or something of that sort. Um, I think this will be the one time that I, um, I have a personal flight to the United States. I wasn't sure how the plane crew would treat me given my exposure, but surprisingly, even before taking my temperature, one of the pilots took my bag from me, not even wearing gloves. Perhaps they could tell by the fact that I was walking to the plane that I wasn't sick. I'd also been giving them my temperature logs. And then once on the plane and after an initial normal set of vital signs were measured, I was more or less a free man. The only place that was off limits was the front toilet. It seems like a pretty legitimate request. In the rear of the plane was an isolation tent. Um, and given I was asymptomatic with normal vitals, I wasn't isolated there. But it did have the only bed in the, in the plane, so I self-isolated, so to speak, to get some rest. We flew from Goma to Kinshasa, Kinshasa to D Dakar, Dakar to the Azores, the Azores to Dolas, Dolas to Omaha. I was told we were struck by lightning twice when flying over Congo, but the trip was otherwise uneventful. I completed the final 14 days of my 21-day quarantine here in Omaha at the University of Nebraska. There wasn't any media presence at my arrival at the airport nor during my stay. Um, U of N had uh, written a preemptive press release specifying the general details of my exposure and evacuation, leading to several uh, journal articles. But amazingly, it seemed that no one dug any further to figure out who, who I was. Media attention was a concern for multiple reasons, not least due to some of the statements that our current president had made during the previous Ebola epidemic in West Africa. I won't speak at length about my time at University of Nebraska because it was an unequivocally positive experience. My experience might have been very different if I, were, um, uh, if I was more anxious about whether I would get sick, but because of the nature of my exposure, I felt fairly confident I wouldn't. This made the separation from my family and my confinement to the hospital much easier. And in fact, being a bit of an introvert, the time was actually restful and relaxing. I was incredibly well taken care of. My hospital room, formerly a patient room, had been converted into more of a hotel room with a comfortable bed, a desk, or fridge. Pictures that my wife had emailed had been framed for me. When I arrived, my room was stocked with snacks and drinks, even a novel or two and some magazines. On multiple occasions, nurses or doctors brought food and drinks. Omaha barbecue, craft beer, muffins, cookies, the list goes on. Not least, a room with large windows and a view had been converted into an exercise room with a treadmill and a stationary bike. And unbelievably, for the first time in 10 years, I actually got in shape in quarantine. <laughs> In addition to FaceTiming usually twice daily with my wife and kids, I had regular conversations with a psychologist affiliated with the unit. Uh, multiple doctors stopped by to learn more about our work in the Congo and my experience being evacuated. In addition, Ted was in daily contact with my family and my organization, Surge, providing humorous updates on my condition. I'm not sure if you can read these, but they were quite humorous. Throughout my two weeks in Nebraska, I was asked regularly for feedback on my experience, both in order to improve my experience, but also to prepare for, for future guests of the quarantine unit. I don't know that I have much to say about my own quarantine that's terribly profound or insightful. I think most, the most stressful part of the, the 21 days was figuring out with whom I could share um, about my exposure as I traveled from Nyankunde to Goma. Um, well, I knew that I was not infectious, and there's no, um, there's no evidence to show that when you're not symptomatic, you, you are, are contagious. Uh, I knew that still the potential public health implications, if I had gotten sick during this voyage, were significant. I could have brought Ebola to Goma, uh, the biggest city on, um, on the eastern border of, of Congo. And not only this, Goma sits 
on the border with Rwanda and a flight away from Kinshasa, Addis Ababa, Kampala, and elsewhere. If I developed symptoms, I would have revealed my reasons for traveling immediately. But in the absence of symptoms, would sharing this information result in delays that would prevent me from getting on the flight that the State Department was moving mountains to arrange for me? I decided to not take the risk. I'm not sure what I would do if I had to do it over again. As I thought more about what I could say that could be helpful, I wanted to share a bit about the experience of our hospital uh, in Congo during this Ebola outbreak. Uh, I think it, it provides some insight into some of the things that we might have to deal with in, in, in quarantine and medical isolation situations. In the early days of the outbreak last August, Samaritan's Purse provided a large amount of personal protective equipment and other materials to our hospital. They trained many of our hospital staff to recognize and appropriately triage potential Ebola cases, and they helped us convert one of our buildings into an Ebola isolation unit. I think it's safe to say that we were prepared for Ebola earlier than any other hospital in our province. Interestingly, however, our patient numbers dropped precipitously over the sub subsequent weeks and months. This was likely multifactorial. However, I think the biggest factor in the fall in patient volume was the fear of being isolated as a s suspected Ebola case. At our hospital, this fear manifested as hesitation to come to the hospital, as lies about where patients were coming from, and the refusal to be isolated or transferred to a center for Ebola testing. In North Kivu, to our south, where the epicenter is, this fear manifested as deep suspicion of Ebola control efforts extending even to violent attacks on treatment centers and the killing of, of numerous healthcare workers. While extensive vaccination campaigns, uh, the availability, uh, availability of an experimental Ebola treatment, um, and incredible work by numerous NGOs and governments have mitigated somewhat the fallout, I think it's this fear, this fear of isolation um, superimposed on the baseline instability of Eastern DRC that has resulted in an outbreak that shows no end in sight. According to the most recent numbers published by the Congolese Ministry of Health, there have now been over 1,800 cases and over 1,200 deaths. My knowledge of the history and legal aspects of quarantine is minimal, but at the very, very basic level, it's a strategy to minimize risk. And one thing I think is being learned from the current outbreak in Congo is that in seeking to eliminate risk, we often increase it. Forced quarantine can lead to fear, to a sense of isolation, to stigma, to the perception that one's freedoms are being taken away unjustly. And the question is to what extent are the benefits that come from reducing risk through quarantine and medical isolation, are they worth that cost? I suspect that Americans are perhaps the people who might react most vocally against the idea of forced quarantine. It's a loss of the freedom we value above almost anything else. But at the same time, I think the individualism that pervades our culture also uniquely prepares someone to, enjoy, uh, to endure and even enjoy quarantine. We're the people who like escaping alone to the mountains, who value the solitary individual, who want to live farther and farther away from each other. For us, quarantine might actually give us the solitude we've been seeking. But in contrast, a growing percentage of Americans come from places like Congo. Many of these people are accustomed to not having a voice. They're accustomed to having abusive governments that force things on them. They're also communal, and community interests take priority over individual interests. They do not think in terms of the nuclear family, but rather of an enormous extended network of kin to which they have obligations. And I think the idea of externally imposed limitations on freedom, like quarantine, for the sake of the community will likely be less inherently distasteful. And yet, as can be seen in Congo, these same communal tendencies can also lead to a deep fear of public health measures like quarantine. I recently asked Denise, the Congolese nanny of our children, how she would feel if she arrived at the hospital feeling sick and was told that she needed to be isolated for a few days while being tested for Ebola. I assured her that I did not think she had Ebola, but that it was simply necessary to test her to confirm this. And in the meantime, she, she just couldn't see her family. She lives in a very small house with 10 family members. 
Her mother is a longtime nurse uh, at our hospital, and Denise interacts with us on a daily basis. So you would think that compared to the general population, she would have a greater understanding of what goes on at the hospital and a greater trust about that. But when I posed this question, a look of horror came over her face. And as I spoke further with her, what was clear was that the, the isolation that I was talking about scared her as much or more than Ebola did. And I don't know that any of us will ever be able to fully understand that fear, but it's there. It's pervasive in Congo, and I assume it's here as well. And when you add this inherent fear of isolation to the acquired distrust of government, as is widespread in Congo and many other countries, and including our own, you have a problem waiting to happen. You have the seeds of what is happening currently in Congo. So how can isolation, whether of simply exposed or actually diseased persons, be a blessing and not a curse? How can this practice protect the community even while preserving the dignity of those who are isolated? And, and um, reminding them that they're actually part of our, our community. I think it was a fairly easy, I was a fairly easy case. Uh, I wasn't sick, of course. Um, and I'm an American citizen exposed while doing work that most people can appreciate. But imagine if I were a Congolese man and I just revealed to Dulles immigration officials that I was exposed to Ebola five days ago in Butembo. Or imagine if a mysterious epidemic of a lethal disease broke out in one of the migrant caravans that just arrived at our southern border. Or imagine it's 1981 and a poor Haitian has just arrived with a wasting disease in Miami. There's little, if anything, that I can tell you that you don't already know about the legal and technical aspects of quarantine and medical, medical isolation. But there are certain things that, even while knowing, we have a tendency to forget, almost compulsively particularly in moments when we are afraid or confronted by those different from us. One of those things is our amazing and fearful capacity to stigmatize, to create scapegoats, and to protect ourselves at the expense of others. There's a story in the Bible where a leper cries out to Jesus to heal him. In the Jewish community, the diagnosis of leprosy essentially represented a sentence to life in exile. Among the laws detailed in Leviticus in the Old Testament is this, anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone, they must live outside the camp. But Jesus, despite being Jewish through and through, touches the leper, and the leper is healed and made clean. This was a radical act of love and a violation of social norms. Jesus touched an untouchable. And just as striking, this was a violation of Jewish law. Jesus broke the law of permanent isolation for these people. He exposed himself to risk. He exposed the community to risk out of love. And he called his followers to do the same. So again, how do we use quarantine and medical isolation to minimize risk to our communities while avoiding the enormous pitfalls we see in places like Congo? It may sound trite, but I want to suggest an answer that sounds simplistic, but that is in fact very difficult. I think we must balance wisdom with love. I think the wisdom part is fairly clear. It means prudently assessing risk and taking appropriate actions to mitigate that risk. But love, what does that mean in the context of discussions about quarantine and medical isolation? I'm not exactly sure. It does not mean touching Ebola patients without gloves. Uh, and it doesn't mean ignoring threats to our communities. But I think it does mean making the decision as individuals and as a community to welcome and care for our neighbor, even if that means accepting a certain level of risk. I think it means that every decision to quarantine someone against his or her will should be painful for us. The word compassion means literally to suffer with. And I think we need to be willing to suffer with these people, particularly those who are most different from us and most resistant and fearful of being quarantined. To the extent that we succeed in finding this balance between wisdom and love, I think that quarantine will succeed in protecting the many, even while caring for and reinforcing the dignity of those being quarantined. Thank you.